Okay, I think we've got everything back. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's learning space. Uh, I'm If you're watching on YouTube or Google Plus, wherever you are, you can use the Q&A app um, to leave us a comment, question. I've um, already got a comment from Michael Jobin in caps, so I have to do the voice. Prepare your minds for scientific value. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. And yeah, everybody over in Europe, uh, please be safe. Uh, I have with me three guests from um, the Giant Magellanic, Giant Magellan Telescope uh, teacher training program at McDonald Observatory. So uh, we have Kelly Finkelstein. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Keely. <laughs> Keely. I'm sorry. Keely. No Hi. <laughs> uh, Judy. Judy Meyer. Hi. You're currently muted, so you need to unmute. Um, the toolbox isn't responding. Yes. You need to click the microphone to unmute. And we also have Mark Wetzel. Hi, Mark. Hi. How are you? Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, Judy, because uh, you're, I can't unmute. You need to press the microphone button to unmute yourself so we can hear you. So try and find that on the screen. <laughs> um, so we, uh, I wanted to hear a little bit about the teacher professional development programs that you guys have going on. Um, first of all, what is the GMT? What is the Giant Magellan Telescope? Well, the Giant Magellan Telescope is one of the next generation telescopes that a, a big collaboration is uh, building. It's going to be um, 20, over 24 meters in diameter once it's all finished. Um, so the University of Texas at Austin and McDonald Observatory is one of the founding partners of the GMT consortium. And so we here at McDonald Observatory have been a part of it for, from the get-go, but we are just now starting to do some of our teacher training programs related to it. Yeah, GMT will be one of the kind of world-class, groundbreaking, extremely large telescopes that, that are going to be coming along um, within the next uh, five to ten years or so. Hopefully GMT has already started groundbreaking, clearing the site. It will be located in Chile. Um, they're casting mirrors already, and hopefully first light at, at the, the telescope will happen right around 2020, and the full instrument will be um, in the full operation mode a, a few years after that. Awesome, awesome. Um, so what do each of you do on the project um, or with the teacher workshop? You want to start, Keely? Sure, I'll start. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an astronomer. I'm here in, in Austin at University of Texas. But uh, a lot of what I do is astronomy education. So I work with um, our astronomy education team, um, those that are out at McDonald Observatory like Mark and Judy. Um, one of the primary things I'm involved in is our teacher training training program. Our, we do professional development for K-12 through teachers. So we do a lot of our workshops during the summer out at the observatory, where teachers get to come out there and visit and do a, a whole uh, few day long workshop with us. So I work with uh, the team out there and I also work with astronomers here in Austin and to develop new astronomy content and, and education materials that we can use both at the kind of K-12 level but also at the university level as well. Very cool. Uh, Mark? Well, hi everybody. My name is Mark Wetzel. I'm the Education Coordinator here at McDonald Observatory. And of course, we're located in a very remote location, as you can imagine. Uh, McDonald Observatory is in far west Texas. It's very remote, high altitude desert, and an excellent place to do astronomical research, and an even better place, I think, to do teacher professional development workshops uh, involved with the Giant Magellan Telescope Project. So Judy and I work together. I'll let Judy speak on her behalf. Um, we train teachers in grades K to 12 here at the observatory, and we also spend time with their students um, when they come visit the observatory. So we provide standard-based education programs for these kids and the students and these teachers when they visit the observatory, and in the summer we do professional development. 
Uh, we also have a video conferencing studio here, and we provide education programs, the same ones that have been altered so that they uh, accommodate video conferencing technologies to students across Texas and the nation. So that's what I do. I'm involved with, uh, with Keeley's team. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, Judy? Uh, we still can't hear you. I, if you if you want to leave the hangout and come back in, that might that should recycle your audio. Yeah. Okay. I could I could I could lip read that. Let me try that. <laughs> Usually I can't lip read. Um, so why don't you uh, guys tell me a little bit about the recent workshop? So it happened over June 29th to July 1st. Uh, tell us a little bit about that that teacher workshop. Yeah, so we had 15 uh, teachers. They were kind of uh, upper middle school through high school, so about 8th grade through 12th grade teachers that joined us, 15 of them, at the observatory for this three-day workshop. And yeah, right at the end of June, first part of July. And so for this first one, this was kind of our, I guess, uh, pilot testing of our first workshop related to the GMT. And even though we don't have the GMT telescope yet, we wanted to kind of start to let teachers and um, their students know about this uh, GMT project that's ongoing and will be built soon. So they, yeah, they came out for three days and stayed um, out at McDonald Observatory, kind of as Mark described, way out there in the middle of West Texas. Uh, from Austin, it takes me about seven or eight hours to get out there. We have teachers from all over the country that came. Um, we tried to highlight uh, teachers came from different states that are, that are represented by the consortium of the, the GMT. So we had some teachers from Arizona and California. Um, we had a few teachers from Massachusetts and then other parts uh, around the country as well, of course from Texas. Um, and yeah, so we did, we talked about the GMT, a little bit about telescopes, how they work. They got to tour all of the actual uh, research telescopes we have at the McDonald Observatory now. Um, we, they built their own telescopes, they got to build their own Galileo scope. Um, they stay out at the Astronomer's Lodge out of McDonald Observatory, so they not only get to interact with us, the astronomy education team, but they get to interact with the researchers and engineers and astronomers who are out at the observatory, either live out there or the visiting astronomers are out there doing the observing, and they get to kind of talk to them at different times, at meal times, or when they're touring the telescope. So it's a kind of all-encompassing workshop, it's not just a here's what the GMT is going to do. But we did talk a lot about the different science capabilities and did kind of fun hands-on activities related back to the science that the GMT will hopefully study and uncover the cool mysteries. <laughs> so what kind of things um, do the teachers see out there? Uh, Mark, can tell us a little bit about the observatory and, and the tours you gave there? Yes. So the opportunity is really fantastic for K-12 teachers. And in, of course, in particular, with the GMT workshop, it was aimed at secondary uh, grades. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity for teachers is really significant at the observatory because we get to immerse them in this environment, this science research environment, and make the astronomy, make the research come to life for them and to give their students, as a result, uh, a real life application for things that they're experiencing in their class. So as part of our classroom activities where we provide training uh, for how to facilitate these activities for their students. We also provide guided tours, kind of as you were just uh, describing. So at McDonald Observatory, the guided tour includes all of the major research telescopes that are here, and there are many. McDonald Observatory has a great, long, rich history of astronomical research and public and uh, public school K-12 education. So of course uh, there's lots to show. Uh, there's a telescope that was uh, completed first in 1939. It was the second largest telescope in the entire world when it was completed. Now it's by far the second largest telescope, but it's still in use today. There is a 2.7 meter telescope. That's 107 inches in diameter. That telescope is used still every single clear night of the year with the exception of some engineering runs once in a while. And that telescope is being used right now for many different types of research. And then of course there is the Hobby Eberly telescope and that is uh, one of the largest telescopes in the world today. It is a multi-mirror telescope. It utilizes state-of-the-art technology in engineering, telescope design, and is doing some really fascinating cutting-edge research that will eventually uh, lead up to, uh, hopefully, an understanding 
of one of the biggest mysteries right now in astronomy and for humankind and that is why our entire home our whole universe is expanding so it will study dark energy so teachers get to see these things during the workshop and I see Judy has joined you in the office oh Judy's right behind me. <laughs> and here's my colleague Judy yes so we'll show you. aim the camera here Judy's with me here now hi Judy uh, so I don't know let if you can see the mic or <laughs> no. Yes. So let me make it. Let me make my settings change so that oh. I can turn uh, the microphone here on the on the computer, and then we'll join you together. Sure. And I have a picture of some of the student. Uh, not sorry, not students. Teachers, um, looking at the uh, Hobby Everly Telescope, and in particular, looking at the the air cushions. Um, that are used to actually, uh, it's been a long time since I was out there, but they're inflated uh, and, and the whole thing kind of moves on this very smooth air track. And it's kind of like, a, a, you can think of it as a huge, large, like, hockey, air hockey type puck mm -hmm. that those, those air bearings, yeah, fill with air and make the telescope uh, move around. <coughs> Teachers are kind of lucky. They get a, an extra behind the scenes tour. Um, you know, they get to go right into the HET and and see it and watch it move, and some of them even get to drive the telescope. Whereas, yeah. just the general you know person that's come to visit the observatory, you, you can go on a great tour, but you you don't get quite that up close and personal with the HET. So. Yeah, that's really cool. Hi, Judy. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'd like to hear from you and, and what you um, do with the observatory and with the uh, the teacher workshops. <clears throat> well, I I work with Mark, and I get to facil facilitate. That's a hard word to say. Teacher workshops and school group visits and public visits. And when people ask me if I'm an astronomer, I tell them I'm an educator. Awesome. awesome. Um, yeah, it's very fun. Very cool. Um, so what kinds of, so you talked a little bit about dark energy being uh, a very important thing for the Hobby Everly Telescope. And there are a whole range of science topics that the GMT is going to be used to explore. What kinds of science did you cover with the uh, with the secondary secondary school teachers? Yeah, I can talk about a few. And Judy also actually helped. Judy and I were we we kind of facilitated this, this first GMT workshop, um, so she can talk about some of the other stuff too. One of the things that the GMT will hopefully do is um, be able to really take detailed images of um, kind of young stars that are forming and maybe even directly imaged planets around these stars. Um, and so we talked about a little bit about the science of uh, new star formation and kind of what these environments look like for how solar systems like our own um, developed and, and how they were formed. So we did some things related to that. Um, another big topic for the GMT will be looking kind of at sort of the beginning stages of our whole universe, looking kind of for some of the first galaxies and the first stars, being able to take um, detailed uh, spectroscopic observations of them. Um, so we, we talked about kind of like what we expect, some activities related to what the, the first stars in our in our universe, what they may, may have been like, and what those big, huge, massive stars have since done, you know, when, when they go off as supernovae, what they have done, how they've helped uh, the evolution of, of the universe as a whole and individual galaxies. Um, do, you, do you want to talk about any of the, maybe like more of the technical stuff we did with light or optics or... Lenses. Well, yeah, we like to 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 explore light and optics and spectroscopy and um, and I'm thinking I should have pulled up the list of what we did at the workshop. Um, we did that. Was it? Did we do that? What would the world be like without a supernova? Yeah, so we did that. that was fun. Um, and but always I. Always, I, I like the spectroscopy. Yeah. Let's just do more spectroscopy. And then the thing that we do at these workshops that's always really great is observing. Yeah. And we use our telescopes here at the observatory, and sometimes we use a bigger telescope, sometimes we use smaller ones at the visitor center, and we observe because most of these teachers don't get to do that. And not with at nearly a dark, not with nearly as dark a sky as you guys have at McDonald's. Right. <laughs> Right, and also I want to be clear too that the the GMT workshop was one of many workshops that we that we offer and provide through uh, through the summer. So yeah, we, we we typically do quite a bit of them, but the GMT workshop was very special for us. 
Oh, actually, in the Showcase app, so those of you who are watching, uh, I, I read in the comments earlier that there's now a notification telling you that the Showcase app and the Q&A app are in the same place. You can switch between them. Uh, and it seems, oh, I take it back, I didn't get it started before the show, so um, I will share in the comments instead uh, the link to the upcoming teacher professional development workshops. I think it's also in the show description as well, if you're listening to this later, it's in the show notes, um, so you guys can look into applying to go to, looks like the 2015 season has quite a few workshops uh, already set up and ready to go. Right. Sorry. We're currently... Uh... Advertising those workshops on our website, mcdonaldobservatory.org. And you can go on and you can get uh, a chance to see what all the benefits are by attending these workshops. Now, of course, for anyone watching, there, of course, is a little bit of an effort to getting here. Yeah. Because, um, you know, as we mentioned, it's a little bit remote. Um, you know, like if you looked at a map of nowhere, we like to say, we're in the middle of that map. Okay, so it takes a little bit of an effort to get here. We encourage people to carpool, and we help you with that. And you can actually ap apply for the workshop uh, right now. Yeah, they're not kidding. Uh, we <laughs> I, we drove over from uh, when I was a summer student in New Mexico, and we went for several hours without passing another car. Many <laughs> many hours without passing another car. It yeah. really is remote. Yeah. Beautiful though. I love deserts. So it's beautiful, like it. and uh, the, the the landscape is amazing, and the night sky is is killer. So it it is totally worth the trip. Yeah, totally true. <laughs> so what kinds of um, I have a picture of some of the activities you guys did, uh, including experimenting with lenses, which looks really familiar because I did this with um, some uh, junior high students uh, for a summer camp. Can you tell us a little bit about this and some of the other hands-on activities? Yeah, sure. Well, should I? Go, all right, go ahead, Judy. Do you want to? Okay. Well, one of the things that we try to do is make the activities that we do with teachers accessible and things that they can they can do and they can afford to do in their classes. And so, uh, the optics activity uses inexpensive plastic lenses and pieces of it's leftover paper that our printer spews out by accident and styrofoam cups. So you can see that in the picture the kinds of things that we do and and we use a light bulb and we look at um, what different lenses do for us and and we end up taking those two lenses and making them into a something that works like a telescope and um, it's a it's a great activity I think great set of activities mm -hmm. talking about how you how you're focusing the light with a lens and then we we've, we've been following that by building Galileo scopes and so it all works together. You've got your objective lens and your eyepiece lens and build a Galileo scope, and there you have it. It's one of the fantastic activities that you'll find in great explorations of math and science. It's a GEMS activity. Okay, cool. Yeah, here's the Galileo scopes in the making. In the making. Uh, this is really great because you get to see how the lenses work outside the telescope, and then you can actually put it together yourself Right. Um, using the instruction. I have one over here. I have one somewhere in my office. <laughs> that I right. It's wonderful it. because it, it helps to instruct what the various components of the telescope are. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, you really understand how the light is traveling through the telescope and what is occurring at the focus of the telescope and how it's magnifying and so forth and so on. So it's really great. So what is it, um, so with, with when you're working with teachers, you have to align to what they need in the classroom. So you have to align to some set of standards. How do you guys um, take this really awesome cutting-edge science and, and apply the standards and mix them together? Yeah, well, we, we definitely do try to make an effort to make sure we're addressing those standards, which are, of course, crucial for the teachers, um, helps them immensely directly in their classroom. Um, so we try to tie in a majority of our our activities or lesson plans that we present in the workshop. We tie them both to the national science uh, education standards and or the next generation science standards that now come in place. Uh, Texas has its own um, science edu education standards across across the board, across grade level, and um, astronomy is one of the uh, high school science class that's offered in, in a number of uh, place schools and everything around. So there's specific astronomy. Um, science standards um, for the high school level as well as in the middle school and elementary grade levels just in general science. So we will um, we try to address of course that they're kind of can be a little bit especially middle school or elementary they're going to be the science standards will be a little you know the more general kind of concepts talking about 
the solar system or the planets or the phases of the moon. Um, when you start to get up to middle school and high school, um, that's why we kind of offer the workshops to specific grade levels because then we can go in a little bit more detail. Um, we can talk about light and optics that tie in. We'll talk about how by doing the hands-on activity, they, they can you know see these ways that they can incorporate um, how lenses work and then take that out to the next step, mirrors and directly out to telescopes and and um, then going into like spectroscopy or light and, and how different properties of light. Um, so yeah, each workshop we'll kind of talk about that. We'll also give the teachers a chance kind of at the end of each day or a couple times throughout the day to sort of reflect on all the different activities we've done that, that day and, and how that ties in specifically for them and how they would maybe use that specifically in their classroom at their grade level. Um, we'll do kind of like concept mapping. Sometimes it's teachers like it, sometimes they don't, but they, it gives them a chance just to sort of reflect at the end of the day on, on everything we've done and, and have something to take back home. And they can, oh yeah, this was, this was good for this specific uh, science standard or this specific activity lesson I want to do in my classroom will tie into this overall uh, concept. Excellent. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about more about what a concept map is and how the teachers use that? Um, yeah, so concept, we kind of leave it, you know, it's sort of a free form time for them, but we leave it a <coughs> yeah, concept map is, you know, so maybe for them, the general, you know, they, they can make, you know, give, we give them a big piece of uh, paper, construction paper, and, uh, you know, the, and have different concepts and everything can kind of be, you can make linkages between different things, so maybe they have their overall overreaching concept for, for the workshop is the workshop itself or the, the theme of the workshop, whether it's galaxies or the giant Magellan telescope. Um, and then, you know, maybe they would make different sort of little bubbles for the different activities. And, but then, again, the main thing is kind of making these linkages back from um, the different activities back to the science standards and grouping different, different types of activities could be grouped together and kind of, make, again, making those connections and how they will use them in the classroom. And they go back at the end of the summer. Cool. So this was the was this the, the bleh, sorry was this the first time that the GMT workshop in particular was run or is this? Yes, this was the first time. And so we partnered with the the GMT organization, so the sort of the overall head of uh, the consortium. Um, we worked with some of the um, project scientists at, at GMT as well as some of their just the regular GMT staff to kind of help us develop. Um, some of the content we wanted to, some of the main ideas we wanted to incorporate into the workshop. Another cool thing, we when we do our workshops, we if we can, we try to partner with a, a scientist or astronomer, maybe it's even, um, some of our, our workshops have sponsoring grants um, that helps us give scholarships to the teachers, and so we'll partner with that researcher that mm -hmm. from the partnering grant, and we'll, we'll have a little bit of a time where they can either be there in person to talk and interact with the teachers and give them a little bit of a uh, talk about their own research, their own science. Um, oftentimes we'll do that remotely by video conference just for a short period during the workshop. So, but this time for the GMT workshop, we are actually were able to have um, the project scientist uh, of the GMT, uh, Rebecca Bernstein. She was able to give a, a nice talk to the teachers and, and was a good kind of tie in to, you know, after they've talked about the GMT and seen some of the activities and seen all the different types of telescopes we had at McDonald's, but they sort of bring it all back in and tie it back into the GMT and that, so that happened towards the end of the workshop. Cool. That, um, yeah, that's something we learned when we did CosmoQuest uh, professional development workshops is we wanted to be hands-on and standards-based and, and make sure we had all that stuff and, and we almost forgot the first time. They're like, no, we want to hear this. We, want, we, we didn't want to just talk at them with science. They're like, no, 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 we want a little bit of that. We want the scientists to tell us <laughs> how, how it works on their end. So uh, it's really, really good to get a mix of that in there. Exactly, yeah. Cool. Um, I have a question from Elad Avron. Elad, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, as teachers of teachers, what would you advise teachers to do when engaging um, with science deniers of sorts? I don't know if you talk about problematic uh, issues in the classroom and things like that. Yeah, that can be a tricky issue. <laughs> I don't even know if I have the best solution yet, even my, for my own personal mm -hmm. interactions with people. Um, I, I just always kind of go on it and tell people, you know, science is uh, evidence-based um, and it's, you know, fact-based and, you know, you can give them, you know, lots of these things are theories and they're ongoing theories and we have lots of evidence to support them, but that's kind of the, the purpose of science in the first place is to keep, you know, keep driving and keep trying to ask these questions and keep investigating and, and trying to, you know, 
show that these things might still be the case, or maybe they're not. And so, you know, you mm -hmm. tell until something comes along, maybe we need to modify our theory or, or we have new data. I mean, that's that's okay. That's not a bad thing. That, um, and that's kind of the whole 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 purpose of, of science. And I don't know, maybe Mark or Judy, they have other other sure. answers that they share. Well, I would, I would suggest to the person who answered to the person who asked your question that um, I would I would imagine that probably the difficulty in the classroom is not the denying of science as a process but denying what science as a process has revealed. Mm, yeah. I think that typically people who are, are, are maybe what we might refer to as somebody who is denying it is, is not denying the process that we go through to learn something new. It's that we're denying uh, what it's telling us about nature. And that may be the thing that's rubbing somebody a little bit wrong for some reason or another, for some personal feeling or for some personal reason. As a science educator, our jobs are to explain to people what the process of science is. It's a learning process. We can't deny the process of science because it's the way that each of us learn new things and it's basically the way that educators are taught to convey new information to students. And, and that's, in fact, the way that we convey information, new information, to our teachers in our workshops, is through a constructivist approach. Mm. We first assess what we currently know, and we build on what we currently know by making new connections that make sense to us, new connections that relate to the things we currently know and allow us to understand and to extend our knowledge to new things that we didn't know before. These are things that infants do. These mm -hmm. are things that kindergartners do. Fifth graders do it. Eighth graders do it. Everybody does this. This is how we learn. Uh, and so when we deny something it's not the process that we're denying. It's not the, it's it's not how we learned it. It's what it's telling us. Now we're not doing these workshops to try to convince somebody that their upbringing was incorrect or that their current belief system is incorrect. What we're doing is to con is to help people to understand what the process of science is teaching us and what wonderful, fantastic, and beautiful things that we're learning about nature through the process of science. So as a science teacher, it's not that it, so and I'm just saying to keep that in mind as a science teacher and I feel the pain out there, believe me. <laughs> you nailed it, man. <laughs> that was a great it. That was a really wow, I'm like so inspired right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh Elad, I want to uh let you know we did a um, as we, we were specifically asked this question in, uh, a couple of times, and so we did a whole episode on it. Um, I don't remember when a while back. If you look through the archives with the National Center for Science Education, uh, we talked with Josh. I think we talked with Josh Rosenau um, about this very issue. Not so much as related to astronomy, but as related to uh, biology teachers deal with evolution and, and climate change issues in the classroom. So we do have an episode on that um, where we, we we kind of focused on that. But that was that answer was was. Fantastic. Um, so I've run into that myself a couple times. And you're well, right. I, 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 would, I hope that that answered his question. Can, can you find out somehow if we I answered think so. his question? Let us know. Let us know in the Q&A, uh, Elad. <laughs> um, so um, we have uh, some questions. A uh, uh, question from Guido Bibra. Um, so our, um, my, my boss, Pamela Gay, used to, went to grad school at Austin and, and uh, we were here he was curious uh, what uh, kind of outreach what other outreach programs you have going on at at Texas and at uh, McDonald yeah I could I can talk a little bit about some other stuff we have here in Austin and then I'll let Mark and Judy talk about more of the other stuff at McDonald but um, yeah it's a it's a big outreach endeavor both here at UT Austin and at McDonald Observatory and obviously Pamela Gay is, a, is a, a great example of somebody that came came from this system um, yeah, in, in, here in Austin, um, it's part of McDonald Observatory, but another big outreach thing that we do is the Stardate Radio um, mm. program and a Stardate Magazine. Um, the magazine goes out uh, bi-monthly, and the radio, the little snippets of, of radio that go on every day um, on public uh, radio. Um, it depends on your area, but I, 
I shouldn't even know the statistics. Maybe Mark or Judy know the exact number, but it's on um, hundreds, thousands of, of... I'm sure everybody can podcast it now, too. Yeah, and you can get the podcast. Yeah. You can actually get the podcast for free on um, startaid.org uh, the day or two days after. You can get them for free, or you can get a, a cheap subscription to get the podcast live. Cool. Um, so that's a big one we do here um, here in Austin. It's associated with McDonald's Observatory. Um, we do a lot of just general outreach, partnering with the, the university. We have public star viewing nights here in Austin, um, three nights a week. Um, wow. Great on our te We have small telescopes on a couple of uh, buildings here on campus. That's a lot. It <laughs> doesn't compare to the star parties that they do out at the observatory. Also, <laughs> three days a week, they get um, hundreds of visitors probably on average every night, so they can they can tell you more about that. <laughs> cool, yeah. Want to tell us about the yeah. observatory star parties? Yeah, let me, let me talk a little about our public programs. Um, we, during the daytime, we offer guided tours to two of our research telescopes, and the only way for any person, just regular people, not teachers, regular people, to see the 2.7 meter telescope is to take the guided tour. Um, otherwise, they have to stay in the lobby and look at the pictures. They can see the Hobby Everly telescope on the self-guided tour, and but they don't get my explanation of it, so so it's not as good. <laughs> um, and and we also do a what we call a solar viewing. We have some telescopes with filters and cameras, and we send images, live images of the sun, to our theater. And the person who's doing the program talks about what we know about the sun and what we understand about the sun, and it's like a 45-minute program, and often we see some really cool stuff, and the other day I was real, I was so lucky. Did you see that prominence? It was this enormous prominence, oh. and I and I turned on my, my um, live view of the sun on this big theater screen, and here's this prominence. It goes all the way across this screen, and I, <laughs> I had like eight people in my program, and they're all going, um, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, so part of my job as an educator is people. You know, most of my job as an educator is regular people. Mm -hmm. So that's during the daytime, and that's every day of the year except for three holidays. And I'll forget which ones, but anyway, <laughs> Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Day, New Year's Day. Otherwise, we do that twice a day. Wow. Um, then three nights a week, we have our public star parties, and our star parties are held at the visitor center, and um, Depending on what we expect for crowds, we'll set up between, last night we had five, we might go up to 15 telescopes. Um, our telescopes go as big as 24 inches and down as small as, what, four? Little? And point at whatever is great to look at. Cool. And we do a constellation tour, and we do some other things, and if it's cloudy, we still have a program because we can't send 400 people home without a program of some sort. And uh, we do indoor things. We might do spectroscopy. We might talk about how to find satellites. We do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and we also have, oh, I keep forgetting, we have the Twilight Program, which is an educational program. You know, it's a, it's a Star Party Night program, and it, it supplements the Star Party, and it's a, about an hour long, a little extra stuff for people who want even more from us. And um, sometimes of the month it's a program about the solar system right now, and sometimes of the month it's a program about the moon, and it kind of depends on what we're going to be looking at. And, and like last night was a full moon night, mm -hmm. and so the program was about the moon. And then the program specialist who did that program ran one of the telescopes pointing out one of the parts of the moon that that specialist had talked about. So, you know, some, and folks really seem to like that. I'm not, I don't present that program myself. So, but. Also, we have, of course, K-12 education students that visit the observatory with their teachers and also our video conferencing program for example uh, on the 20th through the 24th of this month I'll be holding what's called astronomy day by video conference and so there will be I expect during that period of time the 20th through the 24th about 15,000 students will be connected with McDonald Observatory to learn about what takes place here the process of science, once again, and what it's revealing about the sun. And we make live observations of the sun in their classroom. They make drawings. We do science. And it's a wonderful experience for the students because there are far, 
far too many students that have never safely observed the sun yeah. and seen our own star in a safe way, and we're trying to change that. Cool. Very cool. Uh, I just wanted to point out, Elad says, thank you. Yes, that was a brilliant answer. So, <laughs> okay. from before. Um, so what, back to the, the teacher, so you did the GMT teacher professional development for the first time. What kind of feedback um, did you get from the teachers who did that program? Mm -hmm. um, overall, we got really good feedback. Um, the overall way the workshop is structured has been successful in the past, and our GMT teachers um, really appreciated that, and were, they liked the interactions with both the astronomers and the educators, um, being able to stay on the mountain. Um, we're you know, hoping to develop, I think one of the, the things that they would want to get out a little bit more or, or once we have more of the content is actually GMT developed, you know, real curriculum that once the telescope is either more online or we actually have science coming out of it and that's that's kind of our, our hopefully our plan will be down the line, we'll be able to have more stuff that really ties in directly to the GMT and the science that it does. Um, so that we'll be building on that and that will hopefully go into to future workshops that will be involving the GMT workshop. Another thing we were hoping to do, and I, um, we got good feedback from this from the teachers, is to keep. We often have, we sometimes have teachers that come back, um, you know, a couple years later and attend a different workshop um, if they, they get selected. But we're really hoping to keep this group of GMT teachers and their students connected and, and stay kind of a part of a the overall collaboration and group um, from this point on through when the telescope is uh, finally built and has first lights, and, and so that they kind of we form this network of of the teachers and their students, and it's not just a, a one-off summer workshop that they stay connected. And so we got a, a good response and good feedback on that. And uh, We sent out this uh, announcement to the, those teachers that participated. I'm sure a lot of them are right in the middle of class today, but hopefully some of them will check it out after the fact so on the archive. Excellent, excellent. Um, and then you talked a bit about, about the scientific process. I no uh, noticed you did a kind of a scientific model survey at the beginning. What what kind of things did the sci did the teachers learn about the scientific process as well as the science itself? Yeah, we we, we do that with a lot of our workshops. Um, that scientific model survey, and it's kind of an it starts as an open ended discussion. We have them work in small groups, but then as a larger group, we kind of talk about it. And so, and just asking the questions, uh, what makes up a scientific model? Or questions, a couple of questions, or things like. How would you explain the scientific process to somebody that didn't know about it? Uh, how would you put it in terms they could understand? Um, what are important parts that might need to go into a model for science? And kind of getting around some of those ideas they might not think about, like a model can be something visual, it could be a computer model, it could be a mathematical model. And a lot of them know all this, but it's just kind of getting, them, getting, that going, getting it started to talk about at the beginning of a workshop. And then it's something they can, again, take back and use directly in their classroom with their students. And so what is it like, uh, this sounds like a fully immersive experience because they're staying in the dorms and they're eating in the cafeteria, which is pretty good if I remember. Um, so yeah. what was that like for them um, being a part of the community for a few days there? Yeah, it's always a highlight, I would say, of, of any workshop we do, but yeah, especially for this group as well. They always, when we do end of the workshop evaluations or get feedback from them later on, they, they always kind of state that that's, that's one of the best things that kind of a part that makes McDonald's Observatory workshops a little bit unique. Um, they're not just in their local school district or something, and even though it is as Mark and Judy see, and way out there in the middle of nowhere, that is a trek to get out there. But those that can that can make it, um, it is a great experience. They um, get to talk to other astronomers, and some that might not even be involved in the specific science that their workshop is centered around. They still get a chance to talk to them at dinner time. Um, they go visit the telescopes. It really is easy to set in an immersive experience. I think we, we, I don't feel like we've ever had any negative feedback related to that aspect of the workshop. No, what they want is more time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Usually changes their life essentially in the classroom. Cool. We see so many teachers that arrive here, they feel beat up, they feel like they have no time to teach what they're really passionate about, they don't feel confident to teach astronomy. They all have been, many, many, many teachers have been placed in a teaching environment and situation that they feel ill-prepared to do a good job in because they're, they're doing it out of a sense of duty. Uh, and when they leave, they are refreshed, they're motivated, they're confident, they're informed, they're 
they're able to do what they want to do in the classroom. And we follow up with them, and we typically see them again. And uh, so it's, it, we, we take so much pride in what we do because uh, we see such a change in these teachers when they leave. Because this is a subject matter that um, is, it can f be very difficult to teach if you're not prepared to teach it. So. Oh, one of the things I wanted to say is that teachers have told us that they found it valuable to be able to talk to each other mm -hmm. about about this. And if you think about it, astronomy teachers, usually in a school, there's going to be one. Right. And so yeah. they don't have other astronomy teachers to talk to. And so they're able to talk to the whole, you know, 15, 14 other teachers, and they really like that. And they can, you know, share their ideas and their approaches to things. Yeah. And, and this, this works. This works because the model that we use, Nicole, is that we put the teachers in the role of being the student. Mm -hmm. And we take the role of being the instructor. So we don't, we don't show them everything. We, we start with the process of learning the constructivist approach, and, we, and they're comfortable with that. And they're, they're of course, not have, they don't have to furiously take notes about how to teach this particular lesson or this concept because we're taking them through it the way that they will with their students. Mm -hmm. So when they're finished, because they were in the role of, as a student, uh, they feel much more confident because they've been trained mm -hmm. specifically for how to instruct and how to convey new information to students. They feel more confident to do that. Awesome. Excellent, excellent. Um, Josh, I had another question, and it just flew out of my head because <laughs> I was thinking about that—that that putting the teachers in in students in in the role of students and how uh, they are some of the yeah. The, it's so funny to to watch them uh, learn the way their students do, and then say, "Oh, this is the point where my student would throw up their hand and say this." And exactly. Like, yeah, and sometimes the teachers do that. Exactly, and we yeah. encourage them to say, "Answer this question the way you feel your students would answer this question." Right. <laughs> uh, you know, we're not putting any teachers on the spot, but we want to know how would their students answer this question, and how can we help you in the classroom now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Um, let me see if we have any other questions. Just a reminder, you guys watching, you can use the Q&A app to ask us any questions or uh, leave comments or feedback um, while uh, we're watching, and, and I do have to, to point out this comment from earlier from Nancy Graziano, our buddy in, over in New Jersey. Uh, Mark, you need to do radio broadcast. You have an amazing voice for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you're doing the, doing the webcast as well. As well. Um, any other um, particular instances that stand out for each of you um, while working with these teachers, some aha moment or something really inspiring that you saw? Oh, when, when was there not an aha moment? <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. That's it. What you want to hear? Mm -hmm. um, and do you send them back with uh, resources, or do you have resources that uh, you could recommend for our viewers for for teaching astronomy? Well, I'll I'll jump in if you want. Do you want to answer that? Go ahead. Um, we do provide resources. Lots of resources. Mm -hmm. um, we we don't bury teachers with resources at the beginning. Like I said, we put them in the role of being an inquisitive student and we leave, they, they leave with tools that they need that come from the workshop and specifically from the activities that we've done with them. Uh, and, uh, and, and they, you know, in terms of like a flash drive that's completely full of information, mm -hmm. including information we didn't necessarily even cover in the workshop, but they've received some basic training. We, we typically, we, we kind of tend to traditionally uh, stay away from providing somebody that we've never met before, someone we've never had any connection with, with activities without training them to, mm -hmm. to do the activities in the classroom. Uh, because we find that typically, or at least research indicates that providing somebody with a lot of activities and no training, yeah. um, typically those activities don't get used. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But we do have on our McDonald Observatory website, there is a, a place that we have some published um, activities and lessons. A lot of these are the ones someone will do in our classrooms or we'll do at other bigger teacher conferences when we present there. 
so they are they are accessible and if teachers want to get to them they can get them that way and they're free and able to use them in the classroom cool yeah I noticed you had a link to NASA wavelength as well which is just such a great repository we've brought up on the show many times <laughs> because I find it really useful when I'm looking for, okay, I have this much time in an informal setting, this age, what kinds of activities um, right. are available that you can kind of pull up. But like, yeah, like you said, if, if, you, if it, it's best if you've had some training, right? If you go to one of these workshops and learn how to use them um, from people who design them or people who have used them lots themselves. That definitely makes a difference. Um, uh, I was wondering if you, uh, t I don't remember which telescope this was, but the story of the telescope that got shot. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, you would care to tell the story to our viewers who, who may have not heard this story <laughs> before. Mark, you, you've been here a long time. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay. Um, so once upon a time, yeah. there was a telescope that lived at McDonald Observatory that did get shot seven times, as a matter of fact, and it got hit with a hammer. So the telescope still exists. It's still one of the best telescopes in existence today to do astronomical research. It's, it didn't ruin the telescope, yeah. uh, but yes, it's true that in the early 1970s, just a few years after the telescope was put into service here at McDonald Observatory, and I'm referring to the 2.7 meter mm -hmm. telescope, so that's 107 inches in diameter. <clears throat> there was an employee here at the observatory um, who was carrying, let's just say, it was kind of a, a, a bit of a grudge, and <laughs> uh, let it out on the telescope on the primary mirror. So probably your viewers are mainly aware that telescopes have mirrors of this size and they're pretty large mirrors and they are not like the mirrors that are in our bathrooms and in our cars uh, they are typically very robust they're very thick they're very heavy typically when they are just one big mirror uh, on the telescope this mirror weighs about four and a half tons it's about a foot thick um, it's got a beautiful hyperbolic curvature at the surface. It's coated on the top surface with aluminum. And so this employee uh, did, in fact, take the telescope down to a position where uh, he could actually walk into the telescope, which is not uh, uncommon. It's, a, it's something that engineers do here at the observatory frequently, although we don't uh, typically distribute w w armed weapons to our engineers. Um, he had one and uh, went into the telescope and bang bang shot the mirror more than a couple of times. It would have been really noisy. Yes, t definitely. Uh, it was and in fact uh, a few of the other employees uh, on different floors of the dome heard the gunshots and went investigating. Typically not the kind of sound you want from a major astronomical research facility and uh, discovered this fellow and so they apprehended him and he did put uh, bullet holes into the mirror and he also became pretty agitated that his shots did not destroy the mirror uh, so he hit it with a hammer uh, which also did minimal damage to the mirror so he was apprehended and then given a new job in some other state far far away and uh, as the damage was assessed yeah. so it did turn out there was a little bit of damage to the surface of the mirror uh, so technically speaking it collects a tiny itty bitty weensy amount of light little less than it did before he shot it but the uh, the, the mirror of the telescope uh, still performs in a, in a fantastic uh, way and all to all specifications that we need it to and uh, so that's the end of the story of how one of the large I think actually um, so the trivia might be it's I think the largest telescope um, in the world to have been shot. <laughs> I, I, I love that story, first of all, because the telescope makes it out okay. Um, <laughs> but I, when I was a student, and even now, the, these, these human stories of things that happen in astronomy around mind-bogglingly huge equipment uh, and involving mind-bogglingly huge equipment um, just fascinate me. And so yeah. I... I <laughs> 
And, and I'd also like to just point out briefly as a little side note to the story that he wasn't a science denier. It didn't come from his, his angst or his anger, his grudge was not from that particular area. Um, I think he was a little mentally disturbed. It was yeah, personal. yeah, it was, yeah. It was something personal. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to screen share a picture of that telescope that was uh, being visited by the teachers during the workshop. So if you, if that helps you imagine the story a little better, and yeah, this this telescope's still in use. Um, was this the one that was used to observe Comet Temple, like Temple, which the, the one that was hit with the Deep Impact probe? Yes. That's Temple Tuttle. That's Temple correct. Tuttle, thank you. I, um, I don't know if I, a telescope or, another, or several others. That, that I think happened. that happened when the comet was pretty low in our sky, and yeah. I think there may have been some clouds. Okay. But as I recall, several of our telescopes were pointed in that direction. Okay. I was there that night, so I was trying to remember which of the telescopes. Oh, they also... They also most of our telescopes were pointed at, at Jupiter when that comet smashed into Jupiter. Yeah. Right, Way right. Back. Schumacher, Levy 9. Yeah. That's yeah. right. In 96? Um, yeah. I believe so. Yeah, I was there 94. for the Deep Impact. Um, I wasn't at one of the telescopes that was observing. I was watching NASA TV with a bunch of people <laughs> in one of the common areas. Um, but yeah, that was that was a pretty cool experience for me. So... I highly recommend if you can get out to uh, to McDowell Observatory and check it out, take a tour. The star party sound amazing. Um, do so, and and like I said, I, I have included the link in the comments, and we'll include it in the show notes as well for uh, future opportunities to do teacher professional development at McDonald Observatory, since that sounds really awesome. Um, oh, uh, Michael Jobin says the telescope has battle scars. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair to say. Uh, Nan Nancy Graziano asked a really good question. Uh, this is for everyone. Uh, what has been your most gratifying experience to come out of these workshops? Is there a particular instructor situation that stands out in your mind? Yeah, there's, for me, there's been lots of small ones, and it's those moments when you know a teacher, you know, even if it's kind of it's more almost pre-form or it's not even part of the full structure workshop, but when you get into the kind of the really good discussions with the teachers and 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 they have those aha moments and they and you can see that, that it's something's kind of clicked for them or you can see that enjoyment on their faces when they are and they tell you well I've never seen the night sky like this before and uh, they wish all their students could experience this and they're gonna take you know they're taking hundreds of pictures of their workshop trip and they plan to share them with their students and you can see the excitement from them directly and you you hope that goes for, you know, that impacts specifically with the students as well. Cool. Yep, what she said. <laughs> for, for, for me, uh, there have been several. The, the biggest ones for me, I'll tell you, are when I have teachers that come to the workshop and they say that their school does not teach astronomy mm. and that they do not have the support of their administration to teach astronomy, uh, but they uh, are here, in fact, because they are passionate about it, uh, or perhaps a teacher that says uh, that they have been told that uh, they'll no longer teach astronomy. Mm. Uh, and then they'll come back to us and say, guess what? We're teaching astronomy in our school. Our students now are, are getting uh, the information that you gave to me, and so thank you. And so that's just huge. That means we impact these students. Every time we impact a teacher, the impact is by, is, is multitude by their students and their classes. Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us here on Learning Space. Uh, thank you for sharing the, the um, GMT teacher program with us and, and all the cool stuff you guys have going on at McDonald Observatory. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, Georgia, my co-host, will be back next week. She's been going to one conference to another. Um, I'll have to check the schedule to see uh, if we've got next week's uh, topic lined up. We have several topics coming up, including in two weeks I'd like to do uh, what I announced, I think, last time, a, a fan show. So you guys, uh, some of you guys are here every week uh, asking great questions and leaving great comments. And so... Um, if you want to be a part of the fan show, sharing some of your favorite resources, uh, you can email us at educate at cosmoquest.org 
or you can ping me on Twitter. You guys know I'm Noisy Astronomer, um, and, and let us know you'd like to be part of the show. Uh, so thank you again uh, to Keely and Judy and Mark. Uh, do you have any last uh, words of advice or wisdom or things you want to share before we head out? Come Thanks see for having us. Yeah, and come see us at McDonald. And we're we're planning to have another GMT teacher workshop this next summer. So hopefully Excellent. we'll see some some new people and some new faces out there. Thank you for this. This has really been super fun. Awesome. And say hello to your boss for us. I will. She's in Australia right now, but I'll I'll let her know next week when she gets back. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you, and, and apologies for the tech issues. Um, Google is changing things every week, uh, so we just, we'll just try and roll with it. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>